hello, hello, hello. It is great to see everyone, sort of. Uh, if you're listening, if you're watching live, hello. And if you're listening to the podcast, equally hello. Um, I should do a little apologies first. We didn't do a show last week quite abruptly uh, for a slight technical hitch. And because, unfortunately, I did get COVID, tiny violin, that knocked everything a little bit off course. We had a backlog of stuff to deal with. But the channel is back doing, we've got this documentary coming up, which I'll explain uh, very uh, shortly. And we've got some absolutely fantastic interviews coming up with a with a range of truly fascinating individuals about a whole range of topics. But I will come on to that shortly. Now, today... We're talking in the aftermath of the horrific events in Plymouth, Britain's biggest uh, first mass shooting, indeed, in over a decade, in which five people were shot dead by Jake Davidson. Now, obviously, the facts of what's happened will come out in the coming days, weeks and months ahead. What we do know about the gunman, 22-year-old Jake Davidson, is that he was immersed in what is often described as incel culture online before in the days before he obviously uh, was responsible for the massacre which took place he ranted at his 16 year old girl that women are arrogant and entitled beyond belief um on another forum that he was bitter and jealous that women treat men with zero respect or even view them as human beings now before he killed five people including his mother and a three-year-old girl the this showed very striking evidence of an attachment to so-called incel culture. Now, some of you may be familiar with what incel culture is, others may not be. And the whole point of the show is I'm going to be joined by these two fantastic experts who are going to educate me as well as everybody else. It's going to be a very, very educational and informative show about a phenomenon which really should have been discussed I suppose, on shows like this before a horrific massacre like this took place. We're going to talk about what incel culture is, what's driving it, how dangerous it is, and what can be done to confront it. So we'll be talking about that shortly. Before I bring in my guests, again, as ever, uh, the housekeeping, just uh, if you're watching this live, do click through to the YouTube link. That helps support the show. Press like. Good for the algorithm. More people will watch and learn from these brilliant experts who I'm going to bring in shortly. Uh, but also do subscribe and then you'll get notifications of the whole range of videos that we've got uh, coming up. Um, if you want to support us so we can keep doing and expanding with our brilliant team on union wages, thanks to you, including the documentary we're currently working on about who owns Britain. I think it's going to be a very, very, very informative documentary about power and wealth in 21st century Britain, both in urban and rural Britain, who really owns Britain. Britain. Now that is supported by you through patreon.com forward slash Owen Jones 84. You can give three quid or whatever you have to support us doing those sorts of documentaries, videos which you don't get, generally speaking, of course, at other outlets. And that's made possible because of you. You can also support the channel by using Super Chat on YouTube. You can, that way, I will put your questions to our fantastic guests. Uh, and also at the end of the show, I will thank everybody. We also later, I should also say, have Michaela Loach, a fantastic climate activist. And we'll be talking about the IPCC report and the existential threat, of course, facing humanity, but the struggle for climate justice and a just transition, which younger people, and I mean authentically younger people, not myself, who's just turned 37, uh, who are at the absolute forefront, Generation Z, no pressure, who are going to save the world, hopefully. Now, I'm going to bring in our two really, really brilliant guests who are extremely lucky to have. We're always extremely lucky, of course, to have such a fantastic uh, range of brilliant experts. And these two are very striking examples of that. So let's bring in Dr. Maria Norris, who is a scholar in terrorism and security. And uh, this is confusing. Uh, they're not related. But another Norris, Sean Norris, <laughs> who is Chief European and Social Affairs Correspondent at Byline uh, Times, but also uh, has a book coming out, um, which is going to be an absolutely fantastic book next year, Birth Violence. It will be published by Verso, who published my own uh, book many uh, years ago. It will be coming out next autumn, and I'm sure will be an, a brilliant, compelling read. Just so you know, there's a slight delay. Sometimes happens. That's the wonderful world of the internet in which we live uh, with Sean, but don't worry, we will still be able to hear her fantastic expertise on this issue. So thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Thanks for having me. 
Um, let's just start with, I suppose, let's start with basics. Let's start with the fundamentals. I think some of the coverage on in the aftermath of this terrible massacre has been, I think, confused. Uh, some of the descriptions used about incels by some journalists almost suggest that this is a coherent group of some descri description, uh, as though it's an actual organised faction. Now, that isn't the case. Uh, but I'll start with you, Maria. What is, when we talk about incels, incel culture, what are we talking about? So incels actually is shorthand for involuntary cel celibates. They are a community that started, actually was started by a woman, a bisexual woman called Alana a few years ago. And um, she just wanted to start this online community to talk to people who were having difficulties with relationships. But it was very quickly hijacked by very extremely misogynistic men who I think the, the one way to summarize the incel culture, the belief that they believe in, is that they are entitled to women, they are entitled to sex from women, and that the fact that they are not getting women's attentions or sex from women means that they are entitled to commit violence against women. A lot of incels believe that rape should be legalized. They really organize society in some kind of sexual hierarchy. Some of them strongly believe, for example, that sex should be some kind of trade, public good that women should provide to men and that their lack, their lack of access to women and to women's bodies justifies violence. Sean, I know you've spent, actually immersed yourself online in some of the so-called incel some of these groups. Do you want to describe your own thoughts on the incel phenomenon and what you've learned? Yeah, absolutely. So I spent quite a lot of time researching incel forms and sort of lurking on the forms. And what I found is just this very, very extremist hatred of women. You know, the language that they use to describe women is really disturbing and very dehumanizing. They talk about women as femoids, and they use the word foids for short. You know, this is a very dehumanizing way about women and women's bodies. The working aspect of the incel community line is that they're very obsessed with this idea of the decline, which really links to this far-right conspiracy theory called the Great Replacement. And what the decline is, is this idea that feminism, women's rights, women having access to public space, women having the vote, women having reproductive rights or sexual choices is causing a sort of degeneracy of Western. To reverse this is to remove rights and to put them back to the sphere and to return women to their so-called natural role of being sex objects in reproductive vessels. And I think when we look at the incel movement, it's really important that we understand that there is this very real crossover with white supremacy and this kind of far-right fascist ideology around the Great Replacement and the decline. Maria, do you want to just, you know, based on what we know about the comments made by the by Jake Davison in Plymouth, what's your impression about the sorts of comments he's made and how this links to this broader phenomenon? Yeah, so two things. Firstly, um, just building on what Sean just said, the incel community is part of a broader part of the internet or the world in general called um, the Manosphere that includes also pickup artists and men's rights activists and absolutely have a very deep, strong overlap with the white supremacist community. And it's something that tends to be overlooked, but it's important to highlight. So I wanted to reinforce that. When it comes to what happened in Plymouth, it's very clear from the videos that we have from the shooter that there was this incredible what's the best word to use it, alignment of his beliefs with the beliefs, not just from the incel community, but um, with the manosphere in general. Now, the question is, when it comes to whether or not this is an act of terror, when it comes to the authorities deciding whether or not this is an act of terror, is could that be considered an ideology? Can the incel belief be considered an ideology? So we can call that as Joan Smith does. Um, she wrote an excellent book called Homegrown, which is about the relationship between domestic violence and extremism. And um, it's this belief that extreme misogyny is an ideology and should be considered an extremist ideology alongside far-right extremism and Islamic extremism, that in fact it is the thread that runs through 
all kinds of extremism. What, what's your take? I mean, Sean, in terms of what you've seen, and again, we should be clear, we don't know fully, we've only just heard about this, but you know, in the aftermath of this horrific incident, details are going to be increasingly clear in the coming days. But from what you've read about this incident, what, what's, what's your own take about how it links to this broader phenomenon? Sorry, I didn't catch the end of the question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So how do you think this relates what happened in Plymouth or what you've seen about Jake Davison, how this links to the broader phenomenon? So I think one of the really striking aspects of, of the way incels communicate, and this is kind of linking to what ha happened in Plymouth, is that there is this process of radicalization going on. The way they talk to each other on the forums, you really get this sense of men, one of them put it as, I've learned to hate women so much. I've hate women. Others talk about learning becomes sexually attracted to, to, to girls who are under 16. There's a whole thread in the insult community about this. And you really get this sense of, of men being radicalized and being groomed into this ideology. And I think when we look at what's happened in Plymouth, even it's very early days, we don't know the full details, we don't really know what his engagement with the forums were, if there was any engagement at all. But in terms of understanding a process of radicalization, you know, when you look at the incel forums, when you look at how they talk to each other, it, it we know what to call it when other groups of people, you know, I've learned to hate women. You're, you're, in, you're immersed in these conversations which are teaching you a lesson about women and women's role in society. And I think that's what's really concerning and that's where you can kind of draw these lines between what is said in the forums and the potential violence that comes out of them. Maria, if we talk, I mean, terrorism, this definition of terrorism, which you've, you've already raised. Now, the police have actually, they said this isn't being treated as terrorism related. And this causes... This has caused quite a lot of consternation online because a lot of people would argue, for example, if this was, uh, you know, a, 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 a Muslim extreme, an Islamist extremist, then clearly we wouldn't be debating this. This is someone who expresses an ideological uh, misogyny. Uh, and that seems to be potentially the driving uh, motive behind this horrendous massacre. But it's not treated as terrorism. What? What's your thoughts on that and how the term terrorism is used? I mean, a lot of people maybe don't know, actually. They, they, you know, it's a term which is used casually in the mainstream, but they maybe haven't really unpacked what terrorism is supposed to mean and how it's applied. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, t what terrorism is, is actually a question without answer. I'm um, writing a book at the moment, almost finished trying to answer that question, you know, really exploring the idea that terrorism is a question, is a, is a something that cannot be easily defined, that defines definition. The way that I look at it is that terrorism is a social construction. So what I mean by that is that if let's say outside of our window at the moment, um, a bomb would explode. That is an event, is a violent event, but we wouldn't call it terrorism. It wouldn't be terrorism unless somebody attached the label of terrorism to that action. So what I explore in my work is what is behind the attachment of the label terrorism to specific events. So if you look in the United Kingdom as a case study and what happened in Plymouth as an excellent, excellent case study of this, the United Kingdom has the legal definition of terrorism. It's in the Terrorism Act 2000, Section 1. It is an extremely broad definition. The um, I think he was the previous independent reviewer of terrorism, David Anderson, himself said on multiple occasions that the terrorism definition was too broad and that in itself was a threat to human rights. And it is an extremely broad definition. Anything and everything can fall under the definition of terrorism, but it doesn't. It's, a very, it's used in a very selective way. And that selectiveness is what interests me. So in the case of the Plymouth attack, we have um, in section one of the Terrorism Act, I can't remember the subsections out on the top of my head, but subsection B is that the action has to be um, intended to influence the government, intimidate the public or intimidate a section of the public. Subsection C is that that action has to be motivated by some kind of ideology. Um, it could be political, racial, religious or ideological motive. It's an act of violence and 
what I find more interesting is that section three of that definition says that if a firearm was involved, which in this case it was, then there is no need for the requirement of there being some kind of intent behind it, an intent to intimidate the public or an intent to influence the government. All that is necessary is that the action was motivated by an ideology. And in this case, it very clearly was motivated by an extreme misogynistic ideology. But again, it is at the discretion of the um, the authorities, the law enforcement agencies to make that distinction, to make that choice. Is this, a violent, is this violence, is this act of extreme violence an act of terror or is it something else? And it's quite telling, just as you said, I mean, I said the same thing many times that if the shooter in Plymouth was brown, if he was Muslim, then we would be having a different conversation because this is a very long standing pattern in the UK stretching over a decade where crimes, violent crimes committed by the far right or far right extremists or just extremists of other kinds are not considered acts of terror while extremely similar acts are considered acts of terror. One key example of this is the murder of Lee Rigby a few years ago was immediately considered an act of terror. The um, government made lots of you know declarations about how horrible it was they convened an emergency cobra meeting and announced a new extremism task force a few days after of that mohammed Salim was murdered by a far-right extremist also in a very violent manner and there was silence nobody said anything there was no proclamations from the government there was no cobra meeting calls there was no task force to investigate far-right extremism and for me the most glaring example is what happened to joe cox yeah. that she was murdered by a far-right extremist with very strong white supremacist views. And what has happened? Nothing. There has been no effort from the government to actually understand the threat from the far-right because it doesn't consider it to be yeah. as much of a threat or a threat at all because everything lies on this definition of what terrorism is and what those in law enforcement agencies and authorities deem to be an act of terror. And indeed, we know in the last few years there have been a series of far-right terror plots. In fact, it's been identified as the biggest single increasing potential terror threat. We also saw, I mean, again, I mean, this under, underlines your point. For example, Darren Osborne, who mm -hmm. ploughed his van um, into a group of Muslim worshippers, he actually came to London with the intention of uh, either killing Jeremy Corbyn or the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, a far-right extremist who killed one of those people. And yet it, it's not... It, it, in the collective consciousness of this country, that doesn't register. I don't think that Darren Osborne is a name which almost anyone in this country would be able to recognise. But that's another example of... Or, and we've had, for example, Rosie Cooper, the Labour MP, who a far-right extremist uh, attempted to murder with a machete. Uh, and we've had various other terror plots. Sean, I mean, in terms of your your own work, in terms of this link between incel culture and white supremacy and the broader far-right political continuum. I'm interested in terms of what Maria just said about terrorism and how terrorism is understood. This incel, the, the links between incel culture and the far-right and how, and the violent threat that poses collectively. Yeah, so I think when you look at the incel forums, you do really see this kind of crossover between um, extreme, great replacement theory and extreme racism. I mean, the language that is used about black and global majority people is very, very extreme and very, very disturbing. The big issues that the kind of community has around women is women who have um, sexual relationships with black or global majority men. You know, that's seen as a kind of real attack on their sort of status, their male, white, white male supremacist status. Um, and I think there's been a quite a lot of research, um, particularly sort of since 20, into how extremist misogyny becomes a gateway drug to white supremacy. You know, there is this real idea that these are men who are very resentful. They feel that they've been kind of 
oppressed by society. They feel that there's a war on men and they want to sort of reassert their supremacy. They want to, you know, reassert their patriarchal authority. And then that very nicely segues for them into this white, white supremacist ideology as well. This idea that there are forces that are oppressing them, that there's a so-called white genocide that is being sort of run by global elites and feminism and migration. And that is war. And I think as soon, as soon as you start to allow people to believe that they are superior to one group of people, so men who are, believe they are superior to women and that women are, it's very easy to sort of see yourself as superior to another group of people, such as white, white supremacy over black people. And I think, again, this is why we really need to take these threats seriously and take these spaces seriously. Because as you say, we've seen this real growth in far right terrorism, in far right violence, in the, particularly in the last five years. If men are going onto these forums, sort of motivated by misogyny or motivated by hatred of women, and that is being radicalized and groomed and allowed to develop into a wider hatred, you know, this is a real issue and we need to start talking about it as an extremist radicalized group. Um, oh, by the way, my producer says, Sean, if you want to try Wi-Fi, that, I mean, we can still mostly hear you, by the way, but I'll just leave that with you if it's possible to use Wi-Fi. There's a slight... It's a slight pause, but we are mostly hearing you. But I just put that to you. But I don't, I don't know what conversation you have with my producer. But I'll leave that to you. Just quickly uh, on that, Maria. I mean, is this, do you think, as a phenomenon? I mean, in America, we often hear this expression, white lash, which is, uh, I suppose, for those who aren't familiar with white lash, uh, is the, I, I suppose, a, a reactionary backlash amongst white Americans against the struggles for justice and equality against systemic racism by black Americans and people of color. Is this incel culture equally a backlash against successful struggles by women uh, to assert rights, uh, both legal and, and social? And, and is that partly what this is? It's a misogynistic backlash against some of the successes, obviously there's still a very long way to go, achieved by feminism and women's movements. And also, and this is a slightly odd thing to put to you, but I'm, I, I'm interested in this. And in fact, I, I interviewed yesterday Amiya uh, Srinivasan, who's written a brilliant book called The Right to Sex, which everyone should read. The, uh, the, the interview will be coming out this week. Uh, it's an interaction I've had, I suppose, with so-called incel culture. Um, so there is a, and this will make people sit up slightly because it's a slightly bizarre thing to throw in, but I'm interested in it as because I was thinking about it the last few days. There is an alt-right conspiracy theory that was popularized on 4chan that in my first book, Child's the Demonization of the Working Class, I wrote about an incident. I should be very clear this didn't happen and wasn't in the book. That I walked in on my girlfriend having sex with a black man. And that experience of me being so-called cocked uh, turned me gay. Uh, and this is, I know it's odd, I know it's a bizarre thing to say, but this is a very, this is widely believed in alt-right circles. It's often comes up on my social media feed and they authentically believe this was written about slightly oddly as well in a book called Chavs, The Demonization of the Working Class. But I'm just interested in 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 that as an example of a phenomenon because that's a widely believed view online. I mean, I, I get, I, you know, occasionally threats of violence linked to that conspiracy theory. It's very, very bizarre. So I'm just firstly interested in this as a backlash against successful claims for justice and equality by women's mm. movements and so on. But I am interested in that as, an in, as a case study of, you know, which was popularized on 4chan, this online forum. Yes. So the, the, the difference goes that um, for the privileged, equality feels like oppression. And, mm. and that's, that's what it is. Um, Sean said this as well, and it's very true. Running through all of this, the conspiracy theories, the manosphere, white supremacy, is this twin sense of entitlement and victimhood. It's a sense that the world is against them, and yet they're at the same time, they're entitled to power. They're entitled to money. They're entitled to leadership. They're entitled to be the powerful ones. So it's the, those two are very seductive positions to be in and we cannot so i'm trying to express it so we cannot really underestimate the power of the internet of these silly conspiracy theories that sound completely ridiculous once you think of it to attract people to radicalize people so i i did an interview with um, a colleague called ashton kingdom she is doing her phd in um, southampton university 
and I did an interview with her for my podcast called Enemies of the People, coming soon. But anyway, she works on memes and memification and radicalization online, and she talks a lot, and her work is on a lot of how powerful and seductive memes are, silly memes of conspiracy theories, but memes in general, in order to welcome people into these communities and start radicalizing them because memes they are harmless they look harmless they're funny they make you laugh so they break down some barriers and also they give you plausible deniability right it's just a meme it's just a joke but they are very powerful and very seductive when it comes to acting as um, radicalizers online so all of this is linked to the silly conspiracy theories about you and your book and the conspiracy theories about COVID in general. It's all linked to this idea that, what is it, the, the great replacement theory as well, you know, that white, traditional white malehood, manhood is under threat and is under threat from feminists, from social justice warriors, from woke culture, as we're now called. So it is so interesting to me how the recurring theme through all of this is entitlement and victimhood. I was going to just pose a question to Sean, but as far as I can tell, is Sean frozen? I'm just seeing if Sean can... Oh, Sean is coming in through another... Well, I'll come on to Sean shortly. Maria, Maria, on... I mean, in terms of how we challenge this, and mm -hmm. I know some of the work you do in terms of the government's so-called counter-terrorism strategy and, and the government's own approach to various forms of extremism, often... Uh, what I'm sure we can talk about, but very counterproductive and often involving stigmatizing large uh, communities who already face systemic racism. But in terms of what do you think the government's approach to this particular, I mean, does it even exist? Is there a government, is there an official approach? Yeah, go for it, sorry. No, it doesn't. I mean, um, I have often, whenever I talk about this online, and I've written a few articles about this, I have, um, I've had a few government officials um, write to me and say, no, you're wrong, we're doing lots of work on the far right. And I'm sure they believe that they are doing lots of work on the far right. But where is it? Why can't we see it? Why is it not evidence? Why don't we have a public education campaign on the, let's say this, early signs of radicalization from the far right? Why don't we have documentaries about far right extremism in Britain? I mean, think about, you know, decades ago after 9-11 and then after the 7-7 attacks, how much information, good and bad, there was on the media about Islamic extremism. There were so many documentaries on the topic, so many news reports on it. And we have we have nothing. We have no speeches. I am yet to see a leading government official, you know, the Home Secretary or even the Prime Minister, make a speech on far-right extremism and white supremacy. And I don't think we're going to see it because, come on, this is the same government that produced a report saying that there is no institutional racism in the country. So how are they going to address white supremacy in the country and far-right extremism in the country if they don't recognize that institutional racism is a thing? Sean, I think we've got you back. Yes. So on this, on, on, in terms of a government approach, a government strategy yes. such as it exists, what's your own thoughts on it? Well, I think in the last 10 years or 11 years of austerity, we've seen a real degradation in the efforts to tackle male violence against women and girls, be that, you know, the kind of extremist misogyny and incels, but also in, you know, domestic abuse and rape conviction rates in sentencing and prosecutions. You know, by 2016, I think one in six domestic violence refuges had closed down because of austerity cuts. You know, we now have the rate of rape prosecutions in history, you know, in modern history, you know, Men are growing up and living in a society that is telling them that they can rape women with impunity. And the government has not stepped up to deal with this. If anything, the cuts that they oversaw over the last 11 years has made this worse. You know, today there's an article in The Observer because the violence against women girls strategy written by the government, which, you know, is trumpeted with much fanfare, doesn't even femicide. Right? It's not even talking about fatal male violence against women. So how can the government be tackling these issues when number one they've drained the sector of funding number two they're failing to kind of recognize the fatal male violence against women that is killing you know between two and three women every week and you know the the sentencing the prosecutions of rape has just collapsed you know we need to see real concerted action that recognizes that we live in a kind of epidemic of male violence against women and that we need to have education 
we need to have justice, we need to have a, a strategy that actually recognises what causes male violence in girls. And this is where, you know, incel thing comes back, because whether you're an incel, whether you're a violent husband, whether you're someone who, you know, has committed a rape against a, an acquaintance or a partner, you are motivated by the same thing, and that is entitlement to women's bodies and the sexual entitlement to women's bodies. And as soon as we understand these shared commonalities between how male violence works, the more we can do to tackle it. And I'm just not seeing that from the government. So, Maria, given a government strategy simply, and it, for the reasons you've just described, described, there are institutional reasons why that's just not going to happen. In terms of wider social movements, in terms of, mm -hmm. I suppose, broader civil society, in terms of progressives, uh, in terms of women's movements, what do you think can actually happen? What kind of suggestions do you have in terms of fighting this misogyny and, of course, we've seen an extreme manifestation, but there are lots of other manifestations, of course, uh, of this of this uh, misogynistic culture. So what what's your suggestions about what practically can be done? I think, first of all, there needs to be a wide recognition that we do live in a white supremacist misogynistic society, that we can praise, you know, all the progress that we have and we have made a lot of progress all you we want. But we need to be aware that there's still a really long way to go. And I think a lot of this, when it comes to civil society and individuals, just this idea generally of not getting defensive when you talk about living in a white supremacist society, mm -hmm. because it doesn't mean I'm calling you specifically a white supremacist or a racist. White supremacy is a system, is a way of organizing society that privileges the lives and rights of some people primarily those associated with whiteness versus everybody else, it's recognizing that we are embedded in the system and that misogyny is completely linked to, to white supremacy. That is, it cannot be separated from it. Um, so just two examples of this as well, the Charlottesville attack in, during the Unite the Right, the Unite the right rally, um, the man who plowed into the, the people with the van and killed Heather Heyer, he was chanting while he was doing it. He was chanting um, sh white Sharia now, white Sharia now, which is a meme that comes from the incel and the manosphere as well, you know, about women being there for male pleasure. Just last year, actually, no, 2019. Am I still the only one saying last year for 2019? I, no, I do it as well. I think we should just, get ca I think we should Shall all we be able it? to take a year off our ages as well. That's my new campaign. Anyway. I agree. Um, so yeah, so in 2019, two teenage neo-Nazis were convicted in the UK of um, belonging to far-right groups and, um, and a few other terrorist offences. But what was not reported in the media, and it was not really part of the coverage, is that they were also campaigning for mass rapes and um, and for rape to be legalized and you know launching a campaign of mass rape on women. So these are not two distinct phenomena. And I think there is a tendency to separate the two but we really need to see how everything in the society is linked, that all kind of oppression is linked. And the root of everything, the root of all of this, of misogyny, of homophobia, of transphobia, of racism, lies in the structure of our society as a white supremacist society. And that's something that needs to be understood and addressed before anything else can really happen. Sean, what, if, we, if we've got you, we'll try this. I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm ever the optimist. If Sean is here, What's your own views about a strategy, uh, you know, in terms of fighting this, in not just so-called incel culture, but incel, the incel culture is one manifestation of what we're talking about. What What's your own suggestions about how we fight this phenomenon? So I think the roots have to lie in education, right? You know, there's been a real concerted effort over the feminist movement in the last sort of 20 years to ensure that we have proper comprehensive sex and relationships education in schools in order to challenge those kind of misogynistic ideas about women and men. And I think if we do that, that's a good start. But also we need to be challenging the kind of the misogyny that's in the air we breathe, right? You know, if you are with your friends in a pub and someone makes a sexist joke or a derogatory comment about a woman, you know, we need to be challenging that. We, do, we need to stop normalizing this kind of sexist behavior. Um, and, you know, obviously there is room for government to be, you know, we need to be thinking about extremism, far-right terrorism and extremist misogyny as the dangers and the violent threats that they are. But I think 
you know, there's a real reason why so much of the far right is so adamantly against sex and relationships education. And it's because it undermines their entire worldview that women are inferior and men are superior and that, you know, LGBT people don't have a right to exist. All of these issues. There's huge amounts of campaigning from the far right on this issue. And, you know, we have to think about why that is and therefore really value the importance of education in tackling these misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, racist ideas. And finally, to, to both of you, um, and you've shared so many absolutely brilliant insights, but to, to, I suppose to wrap up, I mean, I should have maybe swapped these questions around because we're supposed to normally uh, end on a kind of what next, how do we fight this in a productive way? But where do you think this is heading? I mean, we've seen obviously misogynistic terrorist acts in the United States, clearly there, um, I mean, since 1980, 1 1.35 million Americans have been shot dead. So obviously it's those massacres are easily more easily facilitated by ready access to guns. But nonetheless, we've just seen this horrific massacre here. How, where do you think this is heading? And how much is it as an international, as, as a kind of misogyny international, the kind of links online and how they radicalize each other and where that will be heading? Marie, what do you think about that? Well, I think the trend is not looking good. Um, the trend when it comes to um, misogynistic violence, violence against women, and also violence from far-right um, supremacists has been going up. Um, in the UK in particular, there has been a huge, significant uptick in violence against women and also violence from the far-right since Brexit, and it has been increasing exponentially ever since. And over the years, we have seen more and more far-right extremists being caught by police and being prosecuted. Um, successfully, which is great. But at the same time, there is no systemic way of dealing with them. There is nothing in this country that is built to deal with that kind of extremism. So people who criticize me and what I'm saying will say, what about the PREVENT program? Well, the PREVENT program was designed very badly, in my opinion, with lots of problems to deal with the Muslim community. And then you have the far right being thrown in, you know, and it's not designed to deal with that threat. And just to say that it's an awful program that is extremely prejudiced towards the Muslim community. But what we have when we look at the PREVENT program, for example, is the uh, referrals to the PREVENT program and to the channel, which is the UK de-radicalization program from the far right have been going up steadily over the years. And now they, take, they have taken over the referrals mm. from the so-called Islamic extremism. But we still don't have any kind of public education or government involvement in what that kind of threat is. And we see recently with the what happened to Sarah Everard and also what happened with her vigil with the way that the police and the government have reacted to women getting together to fight against oppression and also with Black Lives Matter movements getting together to fight against oppression is not to facilitate that, is to try and repress that. So unfortunately, even though you know we're trying not to end things in negative, pessimistic way, it's going to happen. More this more violence is going to happen. There's going to be more extremists. And hopefully we won't see another tragedy like we saw today. But for those of us who are in the community of researching this and fighting against this, what happened in Plymouth was a tragedy, it was shocking, but it was not a surprise. We could have seen it coming. I mean, Sean, lastly, what, what's your thoughts about where you think this is, where this is heading and, and how much of a horrifying wake-up call this should be about what comes next? So I'm going to end on a more hopeful note, potentially, um, because I completely agree with Maria, like this is not heading in a good place. And I think, you know, we are seeing this rise in attacks, we're seeing this rise in normalised misogyny, and that is really concerning. But I do think, I mean, most of my research is around abortion rights and the attack on abortion. And I think, you know, there's been a wake up call in the last year or so, particularly what's after what's happened in Poland with the extension of the draconian abortion mm -hmm. ban, you know, what's happening in Hungary with the kind of attacks on the LGBT community, which again is very linked to white and extremist misogyny. You know, more and more people have become aware of this issue. You know, the United Nations is trying to put forward a clause that would, um, what's the word, kind of solidify reproductive rights as a human right. The MATIC report got passed by the European Parliament a couple of months ago, which again recognised that reproductive rights, sexual rights and women's 
you know, equality and women have human rights. So although things are very bad, things are very bleak, we've been sort of resting on our laurels for a long time. And I think there's now kind of an awakening to the fact that we need to fight back, we need to fight harder, and that, you know, if we're going to hold on to our, hold on to women's rights and tell extremist misogyny, you know, we take action now. And I think action is starting to happen. And that is that I'm I'm glad we did end on a on a on a rousing and optimistic note. But honestly, both of you, that was absolutely brilliant, so compelling, so insightful. Um, and we we managed to take on the internet problem, Sean. We can still hear you brilliantly. So thank you so so much to both of you. Please, by the way, everybody, do follow them on social media. You can follow Dr. Maria Norris at, at Maria W Norris on Twitter, and you can follow Sean at Sean. U-S-H-K-A uh, on Twitter. And obviously she has this book out. They both have this, they both do absolutely brilliant and superb work. And we're very lucky to have had them with so many insights about this phenomenon, about how dangerous it is, about what it represents and what we can do to fight it. So thank you both so, so much. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Cheers, Sean. I'll speak to you both soon. Um, so that was, but they were both absolutely brilliant. We're always very lucky to have such an incredible range of guests. And our next guest is no exception to that rule. This is so, so important. And we're very honored to have her. We were supposed to have her last week, but technical nightmare, but we've managed to get it. We persevered. Uh, so we've got now Michaela Loach, who is a climate change activist uh, with so many caps. Hello, how are you doing? Hello. Uh, for example, <laughs> Uh, and I should always, always plug people's brilliant stuff. So they Ike's po podcast, the Yikes, Yikes podcast. podcast. The Yikes. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes podcast. I was like reading the they Ike's podcast. I don't know what I was doing there. I'll let you explain what that is shortly. Um, but basically, we're talking to you, Michaela, because we had the IPCC report, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, United Nations Intergovernmental Report about the existential threat, of course, posed by the climate emergency so we're going to talk to you uh, about your thoughts just to quickly explain the podcast because i've done such a <laughs> yeah. terrible time introducing it no thank you so much for having me and also like that was such an insightful conversation it was lovely to listen to such brilliant people talk about really important things um so the yikes podcast is basically a podcast about all the things in the world that can make us yikes and want to run away from them all these things that can be really overwhelming and scary and make us not want to do anything and instead fall into inaction but actually these are the things that we need to lean into and engage with and lean into the yikes and then move into action together and transform that emotion so yeah we talk about everything but especially climate everything everything that we talk about links to climate and climate change because that is inherently linked to every social issue that we face the climate crisis will be the great multiplier it is not the great equalizer and anyone who cares about the future of humanity or justice in any way needs to be acting on climate and being aware of climate and getting involved so um it's really important and as you said this week um the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released um, their most recent report, their sixth report. And the last report came out in 2018, and it was a big galvanizer for the movement because it made a lot of people realize how like, difficult the climate crisis is, but also how much we can change things if we actually act. So this most recent report was obviously really heartbreaking in many ways, and you did a whole video on that, so I don't want to go into these things um, too, too much. Um, but it basically told us that there's a lot of parts of the climate crisis that we can no longer reverse, which is completely heartbreaking. I definitely had a big cry. I think a lot of people had a big cry that day. Um, but also there are ways which you can flip a lot of the stuff it said in its head. So there was one part where it was saying that every 0 0.5 degree centigrade of warming increases exponentially these impacts, increases like sea level rise exponentially, increases like natural disasters exponentially. It will cause damage to an exponential degree. But also if we kind of turn that on its head, it means every 0 0.5 degrees C of warming that we can prevent, we can save so many people's lives. We can make so many people's lives better. And that's what I think we need to focus on when we're talking about this report is remember that yes, things are really bad. And yes, this has been caused by a fossil fuel industry and by governments not taking action and deliberately delaying things. But also we still have an opportunity to prevent a huge amount of suffering, a huge amount of destruction, and that we all need to take that on board and realize this is a justice issue, this is important, and that we can do something to change this. So, look, you've been at the you know forefront of organising on this. Like, I am interested in, you know, this is an existential threat, self-evidently facing humanity. We're already seeing ever more extreme weather. We're seeing the destabilising mm -hmm. of entire ecosystems. And we do have a future of nice, cheery way to talk about it of a weekend, but ever more extreme 
weather with catastrophic human consequences on mm -hmm. the only planet that we have. Mm -hmm. So, but it is often quite difficult, isn't it, to mobilize people? We actually do see the polling. People have, you know, the urgency has increasingly uh, sunk in. But I'm, I'm interested in what you feel from your own experience, the most productive ways of trying to get people organized. Because mm. my own experience, I could be wrong, but I think often people find it, you know, in the abstract, they accept it's an existential threat. Mm. And it often seems exactly that quite abstract. Uh, often people feel they talk about, you know, feel they have more immediate issues, uh, which which they focus on. Uh, people often find anything to do with science often quite an ex quite a, a, a tricky thing to get a, a proper handle on the sheer amount of information, and I wonder as well often the framing of looming catastrophe. I don't know if that's in itself demobilizing. I'm just mm. interested in your general thoughts and all that. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that obviously people have a lot of stuff to deal with already that's happening right now, and I think that's why a lot of people find climate really overwhelming because they see it as a future problem, as something that we can care about a while from now. But if we if we look around, if we look at the news recently, climate catastrophe is happening now. It's an issue that is happening now, and it's impacting so many people now. And also, wherever you are living, it will probably be impacting you today, and you won't even realize it. Whether it is um, through pollution, or whether it is the fact that you might live in an area that within the coming years um, could end up being flooded or having heat waves and things like that. The, Met, um, the UK Met Office recently gave their first extreme heat weather uh, warning because of climate change and because of the impacts of, of, of the warming of global temperature. And I also think it's important for us to highlight that if the climate crisis is an existential, existential threat to us, that is a privilege because for so many people, it is really immediate. Um, I have family in Jamaica who are much more um, kind of uh, pro have much greater proximity to the climate crisis. There's flooding that happens there all the time. Hurricanes are getting more frequent. Things like that um, are happening today and are happening now. And so I think from our perspective and my perspective, especially, I live in I live in Scotland. I live in Edinburgh. I'm in a less climate vulnerable area than other people. I realise that there it is a privilege in many ways. The fact that climate gets to be this existential threat, and that I think the best way to mobilise each other is not to focus too much on the science. You don't have to be a science person. I think that a lot of the time just talking about climate as a science issue allows these companies that are exploiting and harming to get away with it for so long. When in reality, the climate crisis is a justice issue. It's one of great injustice that's happening today, but has happened historically. Um, if we look at where the climate crisis impacts the most in the world, and also these predictions of where it would impact the most were done by fossil fuel companies, by ExxonMobil back in the 70s. They knew where the climate crisis would hit most, where it hit worst, who would be most impacted, and they allowed it to continue and also continued extracting oil and gas um, and profiting from that. Um, if we look at what the those areas that are being most impacted. Those are where the global majority live. Those are areas that are previously colonized um, countries. Those are areas that um, are people who are marginalized and who are harmed by um, varying systems of oppression. Even within the UK, if we look at who is impacted in, um, feeling the impacts of the climate crisis most. It is those who are most marginalised by society. So the climate crisis is a justice issue. And I've found when talking to people, when I frame it like that, that it's a human issue, it's not as much, you don't need to understand emissions and science and CO2 and all these different things. You All you have to think about is I want to have a livable future and a livable present. And I want all of us to be well and healthy. I think another way within that is that solutions to the climate crisis have these co-benefits that arise that are really fantastic. So I'm a medic as well as all these different apps that I wear. And from my medic perspective, I can see that the things that also kind of prevent us from making this climate crisis worse also have health benefits that arise from it. And the Lancet in their climate change and health report reframes the climate crisis from previously, they said it was the greatest disaster that could face health in the world. And they reframed it as it's the greatest global health opportunity because of the amount of co-benefits that arise. So basically, like within that, we can see that if we act on the climate crisis through this climate justice lens, seeing it as a justice issue, we actually can decrease social inequality. We can tackle these systems of oppression. We can have real system change, create an economy that actually works for all of us and benefits all of us rather than just um, profiting for a few. Um, we can actually make a better world for all of us. And that's a good way, I think, to get people involved in climate who maybe uh, just don't really get the kind of emissions things, think they have more immediate like kind of things happening on. Well, those those um, immediate things can also be addressed in a climate friendly way that also means that we create a better world for all of us. Sorry, that's a bit of a rambly bamble. No, it wasn't but, um... at all. No, in fact, just linked to that. I mean, just, just a couple more questions, but linked to that, you know, I suppose it's, it's this idea of a just transition, isn't it? Because I mm. think often those, uh, particularly those vested interests, the fossil fuel industries and so on, and their lobbying groups, 
politicians and so on who are very much uh, stooges of that particular uh, political uh, self-interested faction. Um, what they try and do is portray measures to tackle the climate emergency as huge sacrifices that mm. ordinary people will suffer, jobs killing measures, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And I suppose it wasn't helped in one example of, of how that wasn't a just transition was Emmanuel Macron in France um, introducing a so-called carbon tax, which actually did have a regressive impact. And mm -hmm. I'm interested in your thoughts on this of a just transition, where it's not about painful sacrifice, but actually improving people's living standards, that there will mm -hmm. be high-class public transport, so people mm -hmm. don't need to use well internal flights for a start, but uh, cars, um, whether it be uh, creating jobs through skilled jobs in renewable industries, uh, whether it be having greener spaces uh, to enjoy with their families. So I'm just interested in that idea about, you know, making the case for a just transition that actually improves mm. people's living standards. Yeah, absolutely. And I think recently there's been this almost this huge campaign by fossil fuel companies and by the government to make out that um, climate organisations or activists are wanting everyone to have all these sacrifices. When actually, I think so often when we talk about climate, it's not actually about sacrifices. A lot of these um, solutions actually make a better world for all of us. So you talked about a just transition, and that's a phrase I think we use a lot and that people don't understand, which I think maybe we need to change our messaging. Um, but a just transition basically is saying that we will transition away from fossil fuels in a way that centres workers' rights, in a way that centres all of our well-being, and that doesn't have the same impact that we saw when coal mines were closed in the UK, for example, where that wasn't a just transition, workers weren't prioritised, and instead that was done very, very quickly and without um, consideration of those rights. A just transition sees that we'd invest in renewable energy and renewable infrastructure so that actually, when you actually invest in green jobs and renewable infrastructure, you can make three jobs, three green jobs for every job that's currently at risk in the oil and gas industry. So actually, there are more jobs that can be created through a green and just economy. And there are things like the Green New Deal, which is which is pushing for that. And there's a bill that's currently being tabled in Parliament around that which sees that we can actually make a better world for all of us. Things like yeah, green spaces that improve our health, things like affordable um, and good public transport, but also the amount of jobs that are created from a green um, economy, are, it's actually so much more. And also they're more stable because the reality is, is that these fossil fuel companies know that they are going to have to transition away from oil and gas eventually. They have to, it's, it's in um, international legislation, like they have to, they've agreed to that. But they want to delay that as long as possible. And a way they do that is they kind of co-opt these workers' struggles by pretending that they care for workers when actually they don't at all. If we look at Shell, for example, they've recently um, announced plans to lay off um, 350 workers in the North Sea while they also will still say, oh, you guys can't have us transition away because workers' jobs are what's important. When they they, they know all these things, they know that they want, they want to do is make as much profit as possible from oil and gas. And um, a really difficult thing is that the UK government but the oil and gas industry with huge amounts of subsidies from public money. So 3.5 um, billion pounds of public money since 2016, so since the Paris Agreement was signed, has gone to North Sea oil and gas companies to prop them up. And workers aren't seeing the benefit of those subsidies. The people aren't seeing the benefit of those subsidies. The only people who are are the um, elites and the people at the top of these fossil fuel companies. And I'm a claimant on a court case that is taking the UK government to court around these subsidies and saying that what we should actually be having is a just transition. What we actually should be having is investment in a green economy. And that this money, this public money should be being spent for public good and not to prop up a declining industry. And so our case will be going to court later this year um, and you, people can support it at paidtopollute.org.uk. But it's really telling within government policy how much they are prioritizing, as usual, the elites over the, the needs of the many and of most of us. And actually they have the capabilities, they have the technology, they have everything they could to make a better world for all of us and to invest in a Green New Deal, to invest in a transition that prioritizes workers' jobs, workers' rights, and all of our kind of livable future and present. But they're deliberately not doing that. And so I think it's important that all of us um, get behind these campaigns and realize that all of this impacts all of us now. Within our lifetimes, all of us will be being impacted by the climate crisis. It's not something that we can rely on young people to fix because it's something that we need to start fixing right now. Um, and also that we do have an opportunity to do that. There are there are so many countries around the world that have already started doing that. Um, and we just need to have kind of, the strength, the courage and the audacity that we can do that. And I think that, yeah, we can. So we need to do it. And also, sorry, one more thing, because um, I need to make sure I remember to say this, but um, the UK government is set to approve a new oil field called the Cambo Field, um, which basically the IEA, which is, I feel like I'm saying so many acronyms, but the International Energy Agency, they're a very conservative agency. Usually, like, they've been okay with oil and gas for a while and things like that. But they released a report that was actually commissioned by the UK government with other governments. Um, and it said that, 
no new oil and gas can be approved if we are to stay within planetary boundaries and climate limits and prevent climate catastrophe. Um, and just after that report came out, the UK government were like, you know what we're going to do? Let's approve a new oil field in the North Sea. Um, it's just quite embarrassing, really. Um, yeah. But um, but basically, there's a huge campaign around that um, called Stop Cambo that people can get involved with, where we're rallying around to try and say the UK should not be licensing or approving any new oil fields, especially before they're hosting the biggest climate conference in the world in Glasgow in November. Um, and there's so much that we can do to campaign around that. But also that we're not just campaigning to stop Cambo, we're campaigning to create a new future and to create um, a sustainable future where jobs are actually protected and looked after. Okay, no, that was brilliant. And I have to say, <laughs> in in all, no, honestly, I, I, I really mean this, that uh, in, in in darker moments when you, you, you feel the world is not necessarily going in the direction in an ideal world we would be going in, uh, certainly mm -hmm. taking the scenic route to uh, a just world. But for me, seeing so many younger people who were so passionate, not least about climate justice like yourself, and I can now, because um, even though I think, because of the pandemic, we should be able to take two years off our age. I'm now 37. I can't class myself as young. But seeing genuinely younger people at the forefront of these movements mobilising in such great numbers with a contagious optimism and determination uh, and courage, and it does take a lot of courage and resilience to take on vested interest, is very, very inspiring indeed. And you're you're just one example, of obviously, of that and a very inspiring example. Mm. So we're very proud to Thank have had you. you to talk about this and uh, people do listen to yikes podcast which i've now said uh correctly uh i am such a boomer even though i'm actually <laughs> technically a millennial <laughs> uh, i think also I just one one thing i wanted to say about inspiring and hope and stuff remember that hope is not a lottery ticket that we said this is from rebecca solner but hope is not a lottery ticket that we sit on like hoping that we'll be lucky like no one is coming to save us especially when it comes to climate no one is going to come and save us there are no superheroes in this world like we have to save ourselves we have to save each other and hope is this active stance we have to take so if anyone is, is worried in any way about the climate crisis like the best way that you can combat that worry and that anxiety is to act and that's the only way that we'll actually get a better world so realize that we have that responsibility ourselves and we have to take it sorry to interrupt you <laughs> thank you very oh, no, much it's it's such very words. very 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 important and uh, a, a very good note i think to end on and thank you so so much um sorry we as i did mess mckay around so i'm very glad to finally <laughs> because of slight technical issues but also my terrible disorganization this week no, thank you right. so so much for joining us um thank it was you. a real honor and uh, i will speak to you soon thank you speak soon bye 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 um they were all brilliant uh so i i learned a, i mean i'd say selfishly one of the reasons i do this um this show is is to just steal people's amazing knowledge and insights and learn a huge amount and that's what we've i think all done today from incel culture to the struggle against the climate emergency about obviously the horrors of misogyny in a institutionally misogynistic uh, and racist society and the 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 fact is Though, as as was put so brilliantly by Michaela at the end, there there are no superheroes uh, coming to save us. It depends on collective struggle uh, and people's determination, resilience, and courage uh, in in the face of huge adversity. Um, so it was a huge honour to have just such knowledgeable guests to talk about this uh, at great length. So thank you so much to all of them. So before I go, I'm off to see my family for a belated birthday lunch, but. Um, we do have a lot of absolutely brilliant interviews coming up, not least, for example, with Amiya Srinivasan, who wrote, uh, who's written a brilliant book called The Right to Sex. I did actually interview her partly. We did talk about the incel phenomenon. I was already going to interview her before the terrible massacre took place. But we talk about a whole range um, of issues um, um, from pornography to uh, sex work to sex uh, positivity uh, to various debates within feminism. Uh, it was so insightful uh, and I learned um, a huge amount. The Me Too movement and uh, just huge, it, she's just such a nuanced and thoughtful thinker. Do get her book, The Right to Sex. But we'll publish that interview, I think, tomorrow uh, for those who are not listening live. That's uh, Monday. Uh, so do check that out. And we've got lots of other interviews uh, coming up with other very brilliant and inspiring people. Um, we do have this documentary we're working on about who owns Britain. Um, which I think will be, uh, again, very educational and informative. Again, uh, I certainly learned a huge amount 
uh, going through uh, doing this whole documentary and working with a brilliant team. You make it possible on patreon.com forward slash Owen Jones 84. The reason we're doing this documentary is people suggested it. So as ever, what we try and do on Patreon is listen to what people ask us to do, and then we do them. That's what we've done with other documentaries about uh, the by-elections, uh, about um, how companies have profited from COVID. Uh, go, we went to a anti-lockdown protest because people wanted us to. That was certainly an experience, but you can check out all of that on the YouTube channel. But patreon.com forward slash uh, Owen Jones 84, you've made all of that possible with a brilliant team who are far more capable uh, than myself. Um, just uh, finally, if you're watching this live or you're watching the video, please press like, encourages the algorithm so people can hear the brilliant expertise and insights of the people we've had uh, and press subscribe. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, uh, please do also subscribe and leave a review if you feel um, if you feel so inclined. Um, and that is it. I'm going to leave you all to it now. That's enough of my own stupid voice. Um, and I will see you live uh, next Sunday at 12 o'clock. Uh, but do check out the channel throughout the week because we all have lots of very, very interesting videos. And just finally, because my producer is going to kill me, thank you to David Boata, to Juice Campwell, Woody, Monica, Reedman for your support throughout. Uh, they've left uh, they've <laughs> left a shouty message for me to do that. So I have done that. So hopefully I won't get in trouble. Uh, but lots of love, everyone. Uh, have a great uh, day, whatever you're doing. And I will see you soon. <laughs>